and hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, my partner, Malik Hill, and we are April 20th, just after Easter weekend. Happy 420, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I honestly totally forgot about that. But, um, yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. So we had Easter weekend. A lot of sports going on. NBA playoffs have started. We got past all the play play in games. We are into the actual series, and so far they have not disappointed. So we're going to talk about the playoffs, and then we're going to talk about uh, the NBA draft. Some of the top players in the draft. Talk about some sleepers. Um, I think you just said NBA draft. Did I? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. So NFL draft. It's NFL okay. draft. Um, and then we're going to talk about there's a little bit of uh, wide receiver drama going on around the NFL after a lot of guys have been paid. So uh, we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, Malik, you want to recap the final playing games that we didn't talk about and then we'll get into the, the series kind of in order. So uh, as I figured, even though I didn't know it'd be this bad, the Hawks beat the Charlotte Hornets 132 to 103. Uh, it was just it was bad. Everybody knew the Hornets' defense, their team defense, was just honestly one of the worst in the league all season. It got even worse in this game. It got to the point where Miles Bridges, he just got so fed up. He got called for a foul at one point. He ran after the ref, and then as he was walking off the court getting thrown out, he threw a mouth guard into the stands, and it hit a teenage girl. He got fined fined for that, and he apologized, but it just wasn't a good look. It was all bad. They were just they were playing ISO ball. They just gave up on everything in the second half. Hawks moved on. Charlotte has a lot to figure out, mm-hmm. as we both thought. Pelicans played the Spurs. We both thought the Pelicans would win that game. The Spurs, uh, they made it interesting at certain points, but they, they just didn't have enough. CJ McCollum was uh going unconscious for a lot of the first half. Mm-hmm. He was just pulling up in transition. And it was just too much for the Spurs. They had, they had too much firepower. And the Spurs don't have enough. Hopefully they can improve some in the offseason, get some guys to come in, because I don't want them to waste some of that young talent. Mm-hmm. That would be unfortunate. So Hawks and Pelicans moved on. And in the other playing games, Hawks played the Cavs in Cleveland. Uh, Hawks got off to a terrible start. Cleveland came out hot at home. Even though we're not big Cleveland fans here, it was it was pretty cool seeing a Cleveland playoff atmosphere without LeBron. Yeah, and they were a yeah. fun team to watch. They did some some interesting things with their lineups. They played uh, Kevin Love, Laurie Markkinen, and Evan Mobley all at the same time. So kind of a big long lineup, which was fun to see in my, in my opinion. Yeah, Laurie Markkinen hit five threes in the first half. I believe he was on fire. Yeah, but uh, in the third quarter, Trey Young. He had uh, a terrible first half, but then he hit one three, and it just got him rolling for the rest of the second half. Uh, I think he scored or assisted on over half of the Hawks' points in the second half. Yeah. He had like 32 points in the third and fourth, Mm -hmm. and it was typical ice tray in the playoffs. He was the villain. Yeah. He waved at the crowd as he walked off. Cavs, they did a good job, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they It's a lot of positives to build off of. Yeah. I mean, Darius Garland is – Real deal. He's the future. And now Cleveland has a lot of figuring out to do. Yeah, Colin Sexton or Karis LeVert. Mm-hmm. Who do you choose? Who do you trade? What other moves do you make? They got some things to do to keep this train going. They got really good young players. They got a good core. Good for the Cavs. Good season. Mm-hmm. Next was the Pelicans and the Clippers. The Clippers lost to Minnesota at Minnesota. Surprising loss to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Everybody figured the Clippers would win this one. I didn't. Well, the, what you you favor the but Pelicans? I'm, I'm a Pelicans a guy. That's what I'm saying. But at the same time, so the, I want to talk about this for a second because this game yeah. was crazy. Because and at halftime, Charles Barkley called this boring, and this game was boring. The Pelicans were up by like 20 at halftime, or some or something close. And then the third quarter started. And all of a sudden, the Pelicans fell apart. Clippers came roaring back. Clippers all of a sudden were up by 16. And then you're like, what the heck just happened? Now this game is going to be boring in the opposite direction. 
And then the Pelicans made another run, and the game became like one of the most exciting games um, because it came down to the wire. But for a second, it was ridiculous because you're like, well, I stayed up for nothing. And then I was like, well, you know, I guess I'll just watch the third quarter. And then the Clippers just destroyed the Pelicans in the third quarter. And I'm like, what? And it was like every time you blinked, a team made like a 20-0 run. Yeah, it it was it was a really weird end to the season for the Clippers because <clears throat> most people figured because of their coaching advantage with Ty Lue, first against Chris Finch and then against Willie Green, who's a rookie uh, coaching in the NBA, they figured the Clippers had a big advantage. Plus, they have Paul George and a bunch of veterans on the team. But they didn't have Paul George for that game. They didn't, and uh, it it just it fell apart for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pe- people were like, oh, the Clippers are going to make the playoffs. They got Paul George. Kawhi will probably come back. They can maybe make a run. That's all up in smoke now. Mm-hmm. Now in the offseason, they have to try to figure out how to keep all this together and try to make this not be one of the biggest failures of a somewhat super team in NBA history. Yeah. But onto the winning team, New Orleans. Looking you, good. Yeah, you get C.J., well, they start the season, I believe it, they started like 2-14. and 14. Mm-hmm. Then they get into a groove. They figure out what they want to do. Devontae Graham stops playing. They stop trying to make Devontae Graham like the main point guard and just have him play his role of like a shooter and just what, what he did in Charlotte for the most part. Mm-hmm. More of a focus on Brandon Ingram. More of a focus on giving Jonas Valanciunas freedom. He shot 41% from three for the season. Had a standout season, one of his best of his career. But Zion was out for the rest of the season, so they knew they had to make a move to convince him to stay and to be respectable. They go and get CJ from Portland, and it's turning everything around for him. And the underrated part of that move, Larry Nance Jr. was included. Yes. They're, they're, I know a lot of people that it's, – it's a word I'm going to start using more on this podcast, casuals. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of casuals <laughs> that get to voice their opinion now because of social media. I'd say most of basketball, Twitter, and social media is made up of mostly casuals and a few people with actual sense yeah. that just butt their heads in every now and then to say, what are you talking about while there's a bunch of chaos? But, yeah, a lot of casuals, they didn't see this coming. Mm-hmm. They figured it was all for nothing. And the Pelicans are here. They made enough of a run later in the season. They still finished under 500, so kind of a disappointing season. But what are you going to do when arguably your best player goes down? But this is Brandon Ingram's first playoff series. And he's showing, like, he wants to be back in a playoff series. Yeah. And he's not going to go out quietly. And so far he's been good and we'll talk about it when we get into that series I, I think the even better part with him and CJ being together they've played less than 40 games together right it's been like has it been over 20 something yeah something like I, that. I think they've they've barely played more than two months together mm-hmm. and it, it already seems like they are perfectly fine just okay this is your night you're feeling it you get the ball no bi this is your night you're feeling it you get the ball they're not hogging the ball there's no arguing in the huddle whoever's feeling it the other person is perfectly fine with letting them do what they d- can do yeah it seems like they already have so much confidence in each other mm-hmm. and the entire core and i think that's the advantage that you get when you get a guy like cj mccollum i mean he's been around for the longest time he's the president of the basketball players association he and- knows how it is playing next to a superstar right so he knows how to like divvy the attention like he doesn't need to be the guy but he can be the guy exactly and i think one of the biggest question marks for the pelicans was whether brandon ingram would step up and so far he has so yep pelicans made it in the playoffs they ended up they're playing the suns now so uh yeah works cut out for him but let's start from the top jazz and the mavericks that was the first game that we got to see their series has now gone two games. Um, Luka Doncic has not played in either of the first two games. Um, I believe he's still questionable for the third game now. Um, Jazz were able to beat the Mavericks in game one. Uh, basically off the back of Bojan Bogdanovic actually keeping them in it 
for the longest time. Don Donovan had his moments, but yeah. Yeah, he, he came in the third quarter, went crazy. Um, but it was a weird, low scoring game. Jazz won ninety nine to ninety three. Um, it was kind of the the boring series, I would say, of the playoffs. At least the at least game one. Yeah, I, I don't know. Even though, yeah, of all the series, this is the one where it's like no Luca first two games. Mm-hmm. Nobody really believes in Utah at this point, which we'll get to. Yeah, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. And then in game two, the Mavericks are able to hang on. And how did they do that, Malik? Hey, man. He's not a superstar. He doesn't deserve superstar money. We're both well aware. But this kid, Jalen Brunson, mm-hmm. he's got that thing. Whatever you want to call it, that it factor, that he's he's got it. Mm-hmm. When When the team is down, when it's time to step up, when it's time to make plays, when it's time to create, He's 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 getting it done for you. Yeah. And that is why I love him as a player. Because even at yeah, Villanova, they were stacked with pros. And they had Jay Wright. But Jalen Brunson was the unquestioned leader of that team. And they went as he went. Mm-hmm. And as he's gotten better in the NBA, he's proven that next to Luka, he can, more, he can do more than just hold his own. Mm-hmm. He's having his best year as a pro. And in this game, too, in his second – well, not second playoff game ever, but second playoff game ever being, like, the main guy while Luka is out, mm-hmm. he just goes off. 41. Totally 41 points. Eight rebounds, five assists, six of ten. He was efficient doing it, too. That was kind of the big thing. Yeah. And um, – Team shot well over – almost 50% from three, too. Yeah. The unsung hero, though, Maxi Kleba. This dude has shot less than 20% from three since the All-Star break. He's 8 of 11 and in this game. <laughs> he had eight, eight threes. Threes. Maxi Kleba. Keeping keeping the German Dallas Maverick. To be honest, I completely <laughs> forgot that he was even still on this team. Because it, it a lot feels of people like he's do. been around for a long time on, at this point. Him and Dwight Powell, it seems like they've been on the Mavericks for... Yeah. Ever since Dirk was gone, it seems like they've been on the Mavericks. Yeah. But... The yeah, the grit they showed in this game, it's it's weird. It seems like with Jason Kidd, they've gotten even better as a team. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's because his style is less rigid and Jason Kidd gives them more freedom. Yeah. But that that game that game too was a shock. Mm-hmm. And to me, it kind of sucks for the Mavericks, but I think this series so far. It, it's it's more about the Jazz than the Mavericks. Yeah. Because everybody has said, you if you don't win this series, it's over. Yeah. You break it all down. You start trading stuff. They brought in Danny Ainge, and in Boston he's shown, if you're a star player, you can still go. Yeah. What you did the last year doesn't matter. We're all about the plan. Mm-hmm. And losing this game, too, how can you saw fans have confidence and- in this team? And if if they would have been losing, like if this would have been one one and Luca was playing, you'd have no problem with the Jazz. If Luca was playing, there's no doubt to me this would be two zero. That's the other right. thing. But um, that's what I'm saying. Like if this, like if you went on paper and you you didn't know that Luca Doncic was out, you'd be like, okay, the Jazz, they're actually playing pretty good. And then you realize Dallas does not have Luca, and they have no other All Star players outside of him. That's a problem. Um. I don't know. I feel like they need to figure something out, and they got to figure it out quickly. Um, Doesn't this? It seems to me like, even though Quinn Snyder, there's rumors about him going to the Lakers already, mm-hmm. but it it seems like he's lost the team's ear almost. Yeah, like the way they've played the past few years. Two years ago, it's it, they. I used to say they played like the Spurs. Last year, I said that they played such great basketball on offense and did just enough on defense yeah, to just blow out teams for most of the regular season. Now they've, they've barely done anything with the roster. The things they have done bringing in Rudy Gay as a small ball center. What, what is, what is that going to do? Yeah. What is that doing? Like your draft picks haven't amounted to much. Mm-hmm. You hit on Royce O'Neal. Yeah. But outside of that, like what have, what have you done in these past few years? I can right. see why they brought in Danny Ainge because the, the, there's been no progress. 
Yeah. They they don't get anything out of Mike Conley either. It, to me, it seems like he's hurt. Yeah. I, it's it's like he's barely taking shots. It's like on offense, he just stands there. There's something off with him. Yeah. And then the the, the Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert thing. <laughs> That's just. That's been a problem for a little I don't, while. Do you think, it, is it possible that can be solved at this point? I don't think you so. Th- you think one has to go? Yeah. I, I Honestly, I think it's Donovan Mitchell. That's gonna go, and that's unfortunate. But at the same time, like Donovan Mitchell is also in a weird spot where, like, in these games, he's been yeah, he's had like thirty points in both, but he's for the most part been very inefficient. Yeah, and he hasn't been that like superstar level that they need him to be. He's been an all like he's an all star, but I, I feel like he needs to take that next step, or he's gonna be a little bit in trouble himself. I I definitely agree because his his lack of being able to play make is very apparent right now. Mm-hmm. Because outside of Mike Conley, who looks either banged up or hurt, uh, there's there's not much more. There's only scoring creation. Jordan Clarkson is coming in to get buckets. Mm-hmm. Bogdanovich is a shooter. Yeah, they can move the ball around and still look good every now and then, but yeah, it's it's very sketchy. Yeah. So, we'll see where that series goes. If Doncic comes back, it's almost a lock. The Mavericks yeah. will win. Um, otherwise, it probably will be close. Yeah, these these next two games in Utah, I I honestly still wouldn't be surprised if they won two in a row. Just They still have that gear to just take right. off on teams. Yeah, It's just been few and far between lately. Mm-hmm. Next series that we got to see um, on Saturday, Timberwolves and Grizzlies, which a lot of people were excited about, and that actually did not disappoint. Um Timberwolves knocked off the Grizzlies in game one. Uh, Anthony Edwards still balling out. Carl Anthony Towns finally played good after he struggled in the play-in game. He needed that, too. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like they kind of punched the Grizzlies in the mouth early, and the Grizzlies were never able to really come back from that. Um, So that was cool to see. Nice that it's going to be a close series, I would think. But in game two... Last night, the Grizzlies blew out the Timberwolves, and they showed exactly why they're one of the better teams in the NBA. Seemed like they just kind of ran all over them. Ja almost had a triple-double. Um, Jaron Jackson was able to stay in the game, didn't get into foul trouble, hit a couple threes, and, uh, yeah, they just, I mean, they got uh, production from everybody, basically. And they just ran them over. Yeah, you you look at the bench stats. There are like three different dudes in double figures mm-hmm. scoring off the bench. It, they just, I to me, it feels like Tyus Jones almost gets better and better every game. Whenever he comes in the game, there's almost no drop off mm-hmm. in terms of playmaking and just like consistent, steady production, scoring and assisting. Yeah. So that series been fun so far, but um. Really, there's not there's not too many takeaways. It's like the Timberwolves are on a hot streak right now, and it's fun to watch. I'm hoping that this this series stays close and that like the Grizzlies don't just run away with it at this point because I think it's it's cool to see all these young guys on both of these teams, um, especially when they're at their peak, like Anthony Edwards, John Morant, stuff like that. It's just cool to see. Um, then we got on to the Raptors and the 76ers, which we a, a lot of people, not just us. We're expecting the Raptors to possibly be able to knock off the Sixers. So far, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Um, the Sixers actually blew out the Raptors in game one, beat them 131 to 111. Joel Embiid only scored 19 points. James Harden didn't really do a whole lot. Well, he did. I mean, he, he did, did enough. enough. 22 yeah. and 13. Yeah. It's he, honestly better than I expected in the first game. Yeah. Um, but he's not the story. He didn't get his rebounds, though, so that, that hurt my parlay. Anyway. I don't even want to talk about parlays, man. <laughs> anyway. Just... Um, Tyrese Maxey scored 38 points. And it was crazy. Because he was the guy that we talked about that we said he's probably going to be the one that needs to step up. Because if James Harden didn't show up, we figured, like, Tobias might be the guy. But... Tyrese would have to really pick up the slack. <laughs> and in game one, he did anything but that. Like, he just took it and ran with it completely. Um, so they kind of blew him out in game one. 
And then on Monday... Toronto started hot in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, like, Siakam came back, and he's been looking good still, and he played well. Um, but it's just... I don't, it's like the Sixers win... The matchups just aren't good. Yeah. They're just not. I mean, Scotty Barnes almost had a triple-double in the game. So like, Yeah, but then he he went down with an injury. Now, yeah. it's... Without him... I don't see I don't see it happening. Yeah, they lose their defensive presence from that. Um and then the Sixers won game two kind of similarly easily. Um and again you got production from most of the Raptors, uh, except for Gary. Gary Trent's having a really bad series so far. Yeah. In the two games. Um but in this game, like Embiid had thirty one points. So, you know, it he just he did his thing. Everybody on the starting lineup scored double digits. Looks like the Sixers are going to run away with this series. Um, so kind of unfortunate, but at the same time, I, it's probably good for the league to see the Sixers doing well um, and most likely moving on. Then the nightcap for Saturday um, was the Nuggets and Warriors. Um, this game was without Steph Curry, right? Or did, This he was played. the one he played limited. Yeah. So... They brought Steph Curry off the bench. He only played 22 minutes, but he had 16 points in those 22 minutes. Um, but again, another young guy steps up. Malik's guy. Jordan Poole. 30 points. Now, this is what was weird, and I think we brought it up too, is that, you know, early on in the season when they had their injuries, Jordan Poole started the season off hot. And then there was like this weird time period where Steve Kerr like stopped playing him. I don't know if there was just a, a misunderstanding or he wasn't seeing enough out of Jordan Poole in work, work ethic or so, something like that. And his minutes got reduced a lot. And now with the Steph Curry injury, he kind of started playing again. And so far in this series, he's been incredible for he's this been team. Liked. He, he has been the third splash brother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, clay has been back and he's starting to look, he's starting to look better again. And this team, man, they are so deep. It's incredible. Um, I think the Warriors can make a run now. Uh, and then on the other side, I'm scared the Nuggets are getting in that that Jazz boat. That they're right behind the Jazz where they might have to blow it up. And I, it's a shame because partial. Ah, uh, that 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 seems a little extreme to me. It does. With 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 and not having Jamal Murray or Michael Porter, I understand. We we figured they put up more of a fight. Mm -hmm. And it's Denver's just playing right into what Golden State wants to do. Yeah. The the thing is that we've we've known this all season. The roster around Jokic without Jamal Murray and Michael Porter, it's just not enough. It's nothing close to enough. Yeah. That's why he's top three in MVP voting. But yeah, we didn't expect this. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I just I'm scared that even when those guys get healthy next year, that Denver is just, they keep getting in that, that top echelon of the, the Western Conference and they just can never get over it. And I mean, it might end up being because of injuries consistently, but it's just something that I worry about. Um, and then they played their game two on Monday and it just happened to get like the Warriors just blew them out again. It was a close game for a while. And now the the Warriors have this new death lineup that they're calling, similar to the small ball game that they used to run. Um, but now they're running Draymond, Andrew Wiggins, Clay Thompson, Jordan Poole, and Steph Curry, which those guys have only played, what did they say, something like 40 minutes all season together. And so now they're playing. And when that lineup came in, they outscored Denver, like, uh, it's some ridiculous amount, like 20 points in like yeah. Three minutes. I watched That's the entire third but... quarter of that last game, mm -hmm. and it seemed like they could not miss. Yeah, whether I mean, it was whether it was Clay, Steph, Jordan, Poole, Steph and Jordan were going off of ISO. Yeah, when they weren't going off of ISO, they were hitting everything coming off of screens. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was absurd. Yeah, and it's it's terrifying when you see like Steph get into that that fun playful mode when he's playing, and I mean he had thirty four points in twenty three minutes, so. It, that's just a disaster for any team. Clay had 21, Jordan Poole had 29. He's averaging 30 points for the series now. Um and yeah, like we said, like it's probably just going to be too much that Jokic can't can't carry. Will Barton's played okay, 
but like the supporting cast, like Aaron Gordon's not playing very well. He's kind of a guy that you expected to step up in this scenario. Um, Bones Highland has been playing all right, but he's also not necessarily stepping up like you'd hope. Again, he's a rookie, but still in this scenario. Um, I mean, they got Monte Morris, too. He's played a lot uh, in the last couple of years. So they have guys that are just kind of not stepping up. And, I mean, the Warriors are just looking way too clean at this point. Yeah. Uh, then we get into the Sunday series. We had Hawks and Heat. Uh, this series ain't looking good. The Hawks, yeah. we knew that it had to be kind of carried by Trey Young. He's not playing all that well right now. He had a horrible yeah, game one first was, game. It was awful. It's probably easily his worst playoff game he's ever played. Yeah. Just eight points. Mm -hmm. And so far, Jimmy Butler has been lights out in this series, playing really good. Yeah. In game one, Duncan Robinson really helped. He had eight, what, eight threes. threes. Um, and he didn't really do anything in game two. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's, there's not much else to say in this one. It just looks like the heat are just, they're ready to make a run. Then the fun one was Nets and Celtics. And I didn't get to watch a whole lot of this game because I was hanging out with family at the time. Um, it was a classic, <laughs> but it was, it was a classic. I mean, it was back and forth Kyrie back at the garden, like it, it was cool. It was fun to watch. It was funny. And as much as I don't like Kyrie, I cannot, like, disrespect the man. He had 39 points. Like, he's one of the best point guards in the league. Yeah. Every time it looked like Boston might just pull away, Kyrie hit some big shots. Yeah. But he did the not. Real high level. He did too. not hit the biggest shot of the game. That was Jason Tatum. Not really a shot, but, you know, a good play. Layup, layup. at the buzzer. But um, that, the, the way that whole play was executed shows – Teams that are inexperienced don't pull off plays like that. Yeah. Like Jalen Brown, when he first was going down court, I thought he was going to jack a shot. Yep. He comes down court. He finds Marcus Smart. Marcus Smart pump fakes, goes into the paint, looks like he's about to shoot. Mm -hmm. Sees Jason Tatum coming into the lane. Jason Tatum catches it and spins at the same time off of Kyrie Irving and makes a layup to win the game. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. And, um... Which is good because I wanted to see. I was scared that the Nets might be able to kind of end that that Boston run that they've been doing. But you know, Marcus Smart stepped up big in this game. He had twenty points, seven rebounds, six assists. Yeah. And then Al Horford. I mean, he every time huge. he he's he's starting to be like Chris Paul almost, where it's like every time you think that he's done, he still produces. Listen, what what Brooklyn did, bringing in DeAndre Jordan and getting rid of Jared Allen. Will mm -hmm. haunt them for years. Yep. And now you have Al, old Al Horford out playing Andre Drummond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he thoroughly out. He was getting offensive rebounds with Andre Drummond on the court. Like it, it, it happened several times, and I was just like, "Why? Why is Drummond out here if this is happening? Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Also, bringing up parlays, I had him getting eight rebounds, <laughs> and I think he ended with four. He did. Good old Drummond. Why did I trust him, Joey? Why? I don't know. I gave up on him a long time ago. <laughs> I will tell you. I did that. too. I was never a fan. Um, and then, uh, the later series, Milwaukee and the Bulls. This was kind of another weird one. The Bulls looked like they were they had a real chance to win at so, at certain points. They did, and they shot terribly. What the their decisions in the past? I mean, like the last five minutes were very strange. There were a lot of moments where. They should have shot threes instead of twos, and dudes were just I, – I don't know. I don't know what was going on. I mean, they were off. Like, DeRozan, just look at the field Six goals. of 25. Six of 25. Vooch was 9 of 27. Levine yeah. was 6 of 19. <laughs> like, you can't you can't win with your stars doing that. Like, it's just not going to happen. Granted, Giannis the Giannis was the only person that was somewhat on for the Bucks. Yeah, I was going to say, granted, the well, Bucks Brooke Lopez had a good game. The Bucks couldn't score either, but still. Like, that's – Usually that's your time to pounce, and they weren't able to do it. Giannis kind of carried the game. Um, Bobby Portis still playing really good off the bench for these guys, um, and they played tonight, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. So their game two hasn't happened yet, so that will be interesting uh, to see as well. But um, I'm hoping the Bulls can get it figured out 
because like you saw in that first game, even without Lonzo, it looks like they, they got a chance. And I, I, that's all I want. I just want them to kind of show up. And then we got the Suns and the Pelicans. We talked about the Pelicans quite a bit earlier. Um, this game was close in game one for the first half. Was it the third quarter? Fourth quarter? I can't remember. Um, well, it, it really wasn't close. <laughs> the first game, it they held the Pelicans to like 17 points in the first quarter. Yeah, but didn't didn't they come back and then? Yeah, because the Pelicans. Oh, so it was the was it the fourth? Because the Pelicans scored thirty seven in the third quarter. I honestly, I forgot about and, that. And they came back. <laughs> I forgot. But about then, that. so it must have been the fourth. Um, either the late late in the third or the fourth, whatever it was. Chris Paul went insane, and he literally went on a stretch where he scored, I think, like twelve straight points uh, for the Suns. He finished yeah. with thirty points, ten assists, seven rebounds. And was just kind of unstoppable for a little while. And Devin Booker had another Devin Booker-like game. 25, 8 assists, 4 rebounds. So they were able to take it away. And then you just thought, Pelicans just are they are going to lose this series. 4-0. But then Game 2 happened. And it looked about the same, to be honest. Um, Suns came out pretty hot. And the Pelicans, they, I mean, the Pelicans were close. They, they hung in. But Devin Booker, he had 31 in the first half. And miss. his last shot of the half was like from 40 feet. Yeah. And you're like, oh, man, this guy's going to go 60 because uh, he can do it. And then he played a little bit in the third quarter and never came back. He sat down, never came back, apparently did something to his hamstring. Hopefully it's okay because that's just a disappointment for the Suns yeah, it, at this point. There's a report that he could be out for the next two games. Yeah, which is terrifying because yeah. the Suns are one of those favorites. I mean, they were in the NBA Finals. Um, But you have to credit the Pelicans for taking advantage of that. Brandon Ingram had an incredible game. He had 37 points, 11 rebounds, 9 assists, just lights out. He almost had a triple-double. McCollum almost had a triple double. He had 23 points, nine assists, eight rebounds. So the two of those guys are just working out so well. Um, and like New Orleans is sneaky good on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, Herb Jones, we talked about before. The Larry Nance signing. Larry Nance. He's, he's been yeah. just an energy guy off the bench. Jackson Hayes coming up with big blocks and big. Yeah, moments. Jackson Hayes is starting to get there uh, slowly. And. Like, this team has some excitement around it, and I'm curious to see. Again, I I would hate to see the Suns lose because of Devin Booker going down, but. Yeah, this if they lose this game, it would be the biggest upset maybe since the year the Spurs lost to Memphis, mm-hmm. when Memphis beat the Spurs as an eighth seed. Yeah. So that's uh, basically all the playoff matchups. So far, The I think the playoffs have been fun. Um, I saw oh, somebody yeah, I on Twitter, Twitter say, like, uh, you know, playoffs are better without LeBron in them. I kind of agree, in my opinion. I couldn't agree with you more. Because then uh, that's not all that sports is talking about. People aren't talking about LeBron in this playoffs. They're talking about everybody else, which I think is fun. Um, so, yeah. So, we'll update. Uh, we'll do a short update next week because we got to do draft stuff next week. Um, but we'll see. Some of the series might be over by then, by next week. So, we'll have to see um, going forward. So let's switch over to the NFL. One thing I wanted to mention, um, there's been a lot of turmoil for a lot of wide receivers. A lot of wide receivers got paid this offseason. We saw Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, and now the rest of them are a little upset. A.J. Brown being included, Debo Samuel, Terry McLaurin. A lot of these guys might be on the move, and now it's basically official that Debo Samuel will be on the move. He has requested a trade from the 49ers, after having his best season as a pro by far. Um, every team should be looking at Debo Samuel. And while we were actually talking, um, my brother sent me a tweet from Ian Rappaport that said, among the teams to consider as the trade market for Debo Samuel heats up, the Jets, the Packers, the Chiefs, the Lions, and I assume most other teams who like really good players. But... It's interesting that he 
mentions the Lions in general. Um, obviously, A.J. Brown situation, stuff like that, we don't have to get into too much at the moment because nothing's happened. But Debo Samuel, what would you be willing to give up for Debo Samuel if you're the Lions? Would you go after Debo Samuel at all if you're the Lions? He's a very young receiver. My only concern is, does this offensive scheme work with him? Does Jared Goff work with him? If you get Debo Samuel, you you work him into the system. You you do whatever you can. Yeah. It, this isn't the age. This isn't the eighties. This isn't the nineties where you just make a dude fit to what you do. Debo is a specific type of player. He's a gadget guy. He's a receiver, and he can be a running back. He's a lot. He's a weapon. Yeah. The thing that I really like about Debo Samuel, though, one, Jared Goff doesn't have to throw it deep for him. He makes his own plays. He fits in perfectly, in my opinion, with St. Brown and DJ Chark. He's kind of that middle-of-the-field, make-his-own-play kind of guy, but you can throw him all over the place, throw off the defenses, free up St. Brown, free up DJ Chark. I, I like that a lot. I'm a little, like, I don't know if I would want to give up the number two pick for him, but I might be willing to, but this defense is so bad. I just, I would rather give up future first round picks. Like those picks that we got, um, maybe give up those to try to run, make a run at Debo Samuel. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, getting Thibodeau or Hutchinson would be more important than getting Debo. Mm-hmm. Getting Debo would be more exciting, right? But you you need to build the defense. Yeah, I think that's the that's hardest the biggest part. focus. And we also have thirty two and thirty four, which are good picks overall. But the Lions kind of need them too. <laughs> yes. So it's it's hard to say. Um, would I be mad if they get Debo? No. Do I think it's realistic? Probably not. Um, but I would like them to at least be in the running to know that they are trying to make something happen. That's kind of more of what I would like to see. All right, let's talk about more of what today was about. Get into let's get into the sleepers. We can talk about the top of the draft next week more if we, if we need to, um, and we can talk about it a little bit here at the end. But I want to get the sleepers. Some of the guys that people that aren't, you know, that casual. Let's let's start using casuals don't know about. Um, we did a little bit of research, so we saw some sleepers. Now these are at least for me, a lot of these sleepers are pretty decently known sleepers in the actual NFL community. Um, but for people that, you know, outside of the first round don't know about, that's kind of where I'm at. So Malik, let's start with your first sleeper. So that you want to talk about, I have one quarterback, just one. Okay. Since this isn't the deepest quarterback class, right? This is a guy with tons of physical talent, height, size, he started out in the SEC at Arkansas, but it was during those years where Arkansas was down and had no plan, no direction. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't a good situation. So he transferred to the FCS, to Southeast Louisiana. And boy, he put up some numbers. Past few years, both seasons over 40 touchdowns. Not a ton of picks. I believe he only threw like eight picks this season. Over 4,000 yards. Cole Kelly. He is 6'7", 250 pounds. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Big boy. And when he was at Arkansas, he was closer to like 260. Mm-hmm. So he cut some weight and got into better shape once he went to southeast Louisiana. That's like, uh, what was the guy from Buffalo? Tyron? Um. Oh, man. Tyron. Oh. He converted into tight yeah, end. In he's a tight end now. He's a pretty solid tight end, too. <laughs> it's funny because he was one of my favorite prospects because of that reason, like 6'7", yeah. just huge. Yeah, he, he had a bunch of raw talent and athleticism. I think Cole Kelly has a little bit more polish in the pocket. Okay. He can make any throw you want him to make. I honestly, compared to, compared to other guys with that type of height, like Brock Osweiler. Mm-hmm who came out of Arizona State at 6'7", played for the Broncos a few years, got unnecessarily paid by Houston because they're Houston. Mm -hmm. I think Cole Kelly has even more arm strength, and he's he's just as accurate and a little bit more accurate than Brock Osweiler. Mm -hmm. He can make those big throws. The thing is, it's always the question with guys in FCS, 
Yeah. How much does it actually translate? Right. Now, we've seen the Carson Wentz's of the world. We've seen a, a few other FCS guys, Jimmy Garoppolo from Eastern Illinois. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he'll stick in the NFL. Right. But you're always but, willing to take a bet on that size. Yes. Even though guys over like 6'6 don't have a great track record in NFL history. Yeah. I'm just going on the talent and what I've watched mm-hmm. and his pedigree as a quarterback. Coming out of high school, he was highly regarded. He was a four-star guy. Arkansas was in a bad position. He made the good decision to leave. Mm-hmm. If he stayed in FBS, I believe he still would have had had success because of his talent. Yeah. And he settled in and dropped weight, but you never know. Mm-hmm. But in terms of a guy coming out of the FCS with size and talent and all the arm and everything you'd want in a quarterback, Cole Kelly has it. Yeah. He has the production, and he has everything else you'd want. Cole Kelly from Southeast Louisiana. Yeah. Now, I didn't really write any – put any quarterbacks down, but I do want to mention Caleb Ellaby. I think he's a decent guy. Yeah. I mean, yes, he's from Western, so it's a little biased maybe. But I like that, you know, he's a he's a dual threat quarterback. He throws the ball well. A he, really, really good underrated thrower. He doesn't he, he makes pro level passes. He doesn't turn the ball over that often, which I think is a very important yeah. asset to have uh going into the NFL. So that's a guy that I think like if you wanted to take a chance on, um, go for it. Like I would rather the Lions take a chance on him really late in the draft than go for somebody at thirty two and thirty four, in my opinion. So I figured I'd just mention that. Um my first, like, one that I wanted to bring up is the running back class, just in general. Um, there are a lot of good guys. In there's, there. I mean, it's not talked – it's obviously, like, people know this running back class. Yeah, people are more into the receiver class. and Yeah, yeah. but I want to, like, remind people we have Brees Hall. He's a solid runner from Iowa State, just kind of that. Yeah. A lot of people have either him or – Kenneth Walker. Yeah, at one. Yeah. Back and forth between one and two. Yeah. And I know that running backs nowadays, they go, you know, second round. But there is a lot of quality talent. We got Isaiah Spiller out of A&M. Don't forget Brian Robinson of Alabama. It's an Alabama running back. Yeah. Typically, they turn out well. 6'2", 225. Like, I mean, he's not the fastest guy out there. He's a 4'5 guy, but, I mean... What when you watched him against Cincinnati and a lot of teams, he just runs through people. Right. He has enough speed, and he might be the best pass blocker in this class. Mm-hmm. So he has what it takes to play in the league. Yeah. And, I mean, even even a guy like uh, hometown guy Hassan Haskins, he's way down there, yeah, but, like, he's talented. I think he could be a back in the NFL. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of mention that, don't don't sleep on these running backs because I think you can get a lot out of them. And just look at like what we've gotten out of the last couple of years, like Javante Williams and stuff, who might be stepping into a number one role this year. Um, and he's you know a top guy, Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift, all these guys. Like the running backs have worked out really well in recent years for the most part. Um, okay, what's your uh, your next guy? My next guy is also a running back. Okay, he's a guy I've talked about. A lot in college football previews the past few years. He he hasn't really gotten the national spotlight he deserves. And that's because he chose to go to UTSA. And even though they just had their best year in program history, winning 10-11 games, almost going undefeated, Sincere McCormick. Hmm. Sincere McCormick is a guy that could have gone to bigger schools, but he chose UTSA. And from the time he stepped on the field, he was the best running back they had. Mm -hmm. Multiple thousand-yard rushing seasons. This past season, over 1,500 yards, I think like 20 touchdowns. He's not the fastest back, but he has good game speed. Yeah, He's very shifty and elusive in the open field, and he has power. He's not very tall. I think he's around like 5'9". But he's well over 200 pounds, like 210. Mm -hmm. Sincere McCormick is a guy that I won't say he can be like Aaron Jones. 
Both went to Texas schools, both underrated coming into the draft. Aaron Jones became a Pro Bowl, perennial Pro Bowl back. Yeah. One of the best backs in the game. I think Sincere McCormick can be a quality starting back in the league or rotational guy, third down back. I think he can be a very good back in the league for a long time Mm -hmm. if he's in the right situation. Yeah. That goes for most running backs. He has the skill to work on almost any team, but we know a lot of teams don't use running backs in the right way. Right. So I believe in Sincere McCormick. He has a ton of talent. Okay. He deserves to get some shine. Well, I was going to I was going to save this guy for kind of my last cuz he's like the most exciting for me. Um but after you mentioned that, he's on the same team. And it kind of goes along with how your your first um sleeper in Cole Kelly is just his athletics and size and stuff just jumps off the table. Tariq Woolen, cornerback from that same team. Go Roadrunners. This guy, I, I don't forget, I said cornerback. He is 6'4", six six four, four. Yeah. with a 42-inch vertical. And he ran a 4-2-6-40. Yeah. That does not even make sense. Yes. Now, this is a guy that I said, he's, he's one that is, you know, kind of known in the NFL community as a sleeper because – when you run a four two six, you are in elite uh, forty times yeah. at that point. But the guy is six four, and people are excited about Sauce Gardner because he's six three. This guy's six four, running faster. Now, granted, he's it's a smaller conference. You get that kind of that kind of issue in a smaller conference. But how could you not take the risk on those athletic metrics that Tariq Woolen has? Because if you can mold him into something like just being able to get the fundamentals down, his athletic ability will carry him for a while. And Should be able to. That would be fun to watch, I think. So Tariq Woolen was – he's kind of my my guy to, like, watch out for because I think he could, he could make a difference. If he can prove that he can play in the NFL level, which, again, I mean, he's fast enough. He can jump high enough. He's got, he's got all the athletic traits. He's got all of them that he could be something incredible if he can figure it out. So that's my number one. Um, What's your next sleeper? My next sleeper is also a hometown guy. (laughs) Fair enough. Straight out of Chippewa country, central Michigan. Okay. Little receiver, little dynamic receiver returner, Khalil Pimpleton. This guy's barely five, nine. I mean, he is true Homer. Yes. Muskegon born. Barely 5'9". I know that because my grandpa is from Muskegon, so he always talks about the Muskegon prospects. Yeah. I hate to say it. Sometimes the Muskegon guys just don't work out in the NFL. There's been a couple that have made it. Um, Pimpleton, I'll, I'll let you finish after this. Pimpleton is one of those guys that when you watch him run, it is insane. He has power five skill. Mm-hmm. And didn't he, wasn't he at Virginia Tech? Did he start? Yes, I, he, yeah, he, he was started at Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. Didn't do a lot there. Didn't get a lot of time. Transferred back home. 5'9", barely over 180 pounds. Mm-hmm. But you get this kid the ball in the open field, <laughs> it's over. Yeah, It's just over. I watched their game against Western. I believe it was Western. He had like an 80-yard punt return. Mm-hmm. Just juking people, hit the open <laughs> hole, gone. Yeah, I was like, okay, this this guy's nice. Western goes four and out, kick it back to him, seventy yard punt return. Yeah, few jukes gone. I was like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> who, who is this dude? Yeah, like I've I've seen I saw him play a few times. I saw he was fast, could like catch some deep routes, could score some touchdowns, but his just his elusiveness in the open field mm-hmm. and his highlight worthy plays, I. The right team gets a hold of him. Kansas City. He needs to draft some receivers. Yeah. He can Maybe be, Kansas I mean, City. Even if he doesn't work as a wide yeah. receiver right away, special teams guy immediately. Exactly. Debo wants to leave mm-hmm. San Francisco. Get him in there to be another gadget guy. Yeah. This dude, I don't know. I don't, he's, he's, he's slight. 
Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have the bulk that Debo has. He played quarterback in high school, though. That's He's a monster. That's the thing. His athleticism is beyond what Central was. Yeah. But he ended up back at Central because it just didn't work out at Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. He made a great decision because he produced. And as a returner, and he he has some more building to do as a receiver, get better as a route runner. Yeah. Overall, like as a slot guy, if he can put on a little bit more weight, he'd be able to last in the league because he is electric. Yeah. And he is just a playmaker. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen Khalil Pimpleton's highlights, please go watch. Yeah. Because those two punt returns he had in that one game were just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. All right. My next guy that I'm going to bring up, um, not as crazy of a sleeper. Uh, necessarily, again, this is kind of a more of a guy that I would say is overshadowed. Um, and that's mostly because of the team that he played on. I'm going with Channing Tindall, um, Georgia linebacker. And, I mean, obviously he's overshadowed because Trayvon Walker's on that defense. Nicobe Dean's on that defense. Um, Lewisine gets more talk than him. Yeah. But this guy is... 6'2", 230, runs a 4'4", 42-inch vertical. That defense. <laughs> like, his athletics. That defense. And again, oh. exactly. Like, if I told you all that, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this guy's going to be a really good uh, a really good linebacker. He's overshadowed because of the team that he plays for, and he's not getting as yeah. much looks. Which he was does... on one of the greatest defenses. Yeah. To put it I'm, – I'm sorry to interrupt, but to put it into perspective mm-hmm. – Jermaine Johnson, the defensive end that was at Florida State this year, yeah. that broke out and might go first round, like high second, he was at Georgia mm-hmm. the year before he played at Florida State this year yeah. and did not get time. Yeah. He transfers to Florida State and instantly becomes one of the best defensive ends in the country. Mm-hmm. This is the level of talent the Georgia defense has had. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know where Tyndall's going to land, but like it could be late second round, early third round maybe. But I, I can't imagine that happening. But it's crazy that that could even happen. Like, his metrics are just as good. And I, I there was a stat that I saw that he had uh, more pressures or tackles for loss or something than N'Kobe Dean did. And N'Kobe Dean's getting most of the highlights for that linebacking core. So that's just something like, again, it's because of the team that he plays on. But... Do not sleep on this guy. How much time do we have left? Um, like seven minutes, six minutes. Okay, I I have one more offensive player. Okay, this is a guy that I've liked ever since his freshman year, but kind of like Cole Kelly at Arkansas. This isn't as bad, but he was stuck in a Virginia Tech program that just hit a ceiling of averageness. No high level quarterback play, just average. Mm-hmm. No high-level play calling. Just av- everything around him was average. He never got a chance to shine the way his talent lives up to it. This is receiver Trey Turner from Virginia Tech. Mm. He came in and instantly became a top-three receiver on that team as a freshman. Showed out in their first game against uh, Florida State. Had a good freshman year. Next year, his stats go up a little. He has like 40, 42, 41, 42 catches. 700-something yards, like four touchdowns. Good sophomore year. Expected to have a big junior year. Mm-hmm. You got Braxton Burmeister at quarterback. No creative play calling. Nothing to nothing. Just <laughs> just a bunch of eh. Yeah. His career was wasted at Virginia Tech. He has a bunch of skill. Really good 50-50 ball guy. He's almost 6'3". He's almost 200 pounds. Trey Turner is an underrated weapon mm-hmm. that should get a shot in this league, in the NFL, because he's just a really good receiver that didn't get the chance to shine the way he could have. Yeah. Um, my last guy that I'm going to mention is another linebacker. I I, I was kind of looking at linebackers because of the Lions. Um, Brian Asamoah out of Oklahoma. Um, now, he's kind of a sleeper that people are talking about again. Um the reason that he's lower on the draft board is his metrics. So it's kind of the opposite of what we've been talking about. He's only six foot. Uh, he's a little bit undersized. Runs a four or five, which is fine. Um, but the thing is, like, 
people are comparing him to Levante David because size-wise they're similar. And if you were to say that you could draft Levante David, he'd be much happy, much, much higher. Um, this guy is just smart, finds ways to get to the ball, great at getting to the ball. Um, and it's just as his his IQ just like trounces some of those metrics. Um, but he hits hard and I don't know. He's just he's just a good guy that I liked watching on film when I was looking up uh some of these guys. Yeah. I have four more guys, but I'll just stick to two because Go of the time. It. I'll let you finish it out and uh So this is all defense. We can talk about some next week too. Yeah, this is all defense. My linebacker, a guy out of Cal, he played at three schools in four years, <laughs> but got an extra year because of COVID. So he's a fifth year guy. He started out at VMI, Virginia Military Institute, transferred to Independence Community College, who was on Last Chance U. Okay. And transferred to Cal for his last three years, I believe. Yeah. It's quite the glow up. Coney Dang. Wow. That's a name. He is of African descent. And these measurables, 6'6", <laughs> 240 pounds. Wow. Linebacker. <laughs> Just out, of, just out of all of that, the interest is there, isn't it? That's a now, good boy. The production is just decent, <laughs> but the measurables and the athleticism, and what he's shown when he makes plays, he stands out when he makes plays. He just didn't make high level plays all the time. Yeah. Coney Dang has so much potential in that body. Yeah. And but he also has injury problems. Mm. I'm just so interested in a 6'6", 240-pound linebacker yeah. with speed and power. But his track record is, is spotty, so I don't know. Hmm. Lastly, I'm going to go with a safety that is actually pretty well known because he played in the AC, in the SEC. But I don't think he got enough of the shine he should have gotten, once again, because of a program going up and down. And not knowing what they're doing. One of the best names in the draft, Smoke Monday. <laughs> yeah. Safety for Auburn. Mm -hmm. One of their biggest hitters. One of the biggest hitters in college football the past few years. He's gotten kicked out of games multiple times. Half the time when I've watched Auburn, <laughs> he, he either gets a warning or he gets ejected. Because mm -hmm. he's just throwing his head everywhere. When he's not doing that, he's actually a very smart safety. Mm -hmm. Great in the run. Good in coverage, but can get better. He's almost like 6'2". He's like 6'1". Like 190 pounds. I think he's a guy that can be a really good safety in the league for a long time. Mm -hmm. he's, <laughs> he needs to calm down some of the aggressiveness. <laughs> yeah. But it's good. If he can channel that aggressiveness. Mm-hmm. He can be one of the better safeties in the league because he has the talent. Yeah. He's just gone off the rails a, a, a few times. I mean, if you, can get a, if you can get a guy like Cortland Finnegan, I'd take it. So Yeah. Awesome. All right, so we kind of ran out of time. Uh, so next week we're going to do uh, a little playoff update, and then we're going to do a – what are we doing? Two rounds? We're gonna do two we, rounds. Did, we just did one last time. Okay. We have, we had enough time to get through the first. The whole okay, first so we'll, round. so we'll do the first round yeah. mock draft, uh, just kind of going back and forth, um, and then with any extra time, we'll talk about more prospects or something like that. Yeah, we could talk about some of the Lions' other picks that yeah. we'd make at those, right? Um, because the NFL draft is next Thursday, which is awesome. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is going to be probably right one of the most exciting drafts we've had in a little while in, in my opinion and it's because the lions have some solid picks to use. so this has been views from the sidelines we will see you guys next time next week is my birthday podcast joey got any surprises i could bring a balloon it's one one balloon after after these few you're just one man I'm, I'm just one man. okay all right see you next week